Nature has undoubtedly changed by milestones throughout the course of history, both naturally and human-induced. When the Second Industrial Revolution erupted in America in the 19th and 20th century, the introduction of more effective infrastructures like railroad systems and electricity permanently transformed the landscape of America's ecosystem. This transition came thanks to the largest increase in population ever in the U.S., though this is also an example of geography shaping historical decisions with America being a region with rich resources and abundant waterway connections. Both were especially beneficial for commercial transactions. One such example was Florida. Its several waterways, such as the St. John's and Oklawaha rivers, were prime targets to be exploited for economic development and steamboat transportation. The unofficial debate for a canal in Florida began in the 1500s when Pedro Menendez de Aviles defeated the French and established St. Augustine. Menendez wanted to build a fort near the river to protect the water routes from the Gulf du San Mateo and St. Augustine. Though Menendez failed in his endeavors because of lack of funding, moreover, he feared aggression from the Native American groups like the Timucua. In the 19th century, the debate was reignited, though under a new name, the Florida Cross State Canal. President Thomas Jefferson hoped the canal would destroy Cuba's power over trade and link together the economies of the Atlantic and Western waters. The National Intelligence and New York National Advocate conveyed the views many lawmakers held by exclaiming how important the canal would be for commerce and safe navigation around the dangerous coast of Florida. However, the costs were a tremendous issue. Many different versions of this canal have been presented and rejected, but a huge push for a canal in Florida strengthened during the Great Depression. Industrial production decreased by about 47%, and unemployment rose to more than 20%. Florida's economy was hurt like never before, and was already strained from the hardships put upon by recent hurricanes in Miami. The Cross Florida Barge Canal was part of the New Deal program, a series initiated by Franklin D. Roosevelt during 1933 to 1939 to combat the effects of the Great Depression. These programs included the development of infrastructure such as roads and bridges. The canal will be a great way to boost employment and Florida's economy. At long last, all the state and federal agencies involved unanimously agreed upon one route, one plan, a toll-free, lock-type barge canal, higher than sea level. This route is the only one which has an abundance of water. The Cross Florida Barge Canal was quite literally a proposed canal which would go across Florida, connecting the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. The CFBC would be a way to connect both sides of the peninsula. Due to this idea, there would be a shortened commerce route from Texan oil fields, the Gulf of Mexico, Mississippi River, and to the East Coast. A very appealing plan. Later, the solidified design connected different rivers and artificial bodies of water, beginning in Jacksonville, then to St. John's Rivers, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Gulf of Mexico, ultimately creating a path to officially cross Florida horizontally. The large uncertainties regarding the canal, a balance of risk and reward, would prove to bring major reform to America and tell the story of modern Florida as we know. Groups supported the canal's construction for various reasons. First, means of national defense were to be augmented through troop and supply movement, avoiding dangerous coasts of southern Florida, especially the Keys. The existing commerce route had brought American commerce too close to potentially dangerous Cuban naval forces. Floridians also aspired that it would aid the state's economic progress and revenue following the Great Depression. Many individuals, such as businessmen from Jacksonville, also saw the Cross Florida Barge Canal as an opportunity to make more money. Economic reports in 1962 produced benefit-to-cost ratios ranging 1.01 to 1.17, which ultimately supported the idea that it would benefit the economy. Another stressed objective was job addition. Senator of the time, Duncan U. Fletcher, was focused on creating jobs, proposing a public work administration, emphasizing the canal as a major beneficiary. As counter-argument, however, 
1976 Reese study determined that the number of individuals expected to migrate or be employed for the canal was rather insignificant. Critics also claimed that the canal's design was too narrow and shallow for adequate transportation. Its designated path also upset local populations concerned of displacement. Some believed politicians were using construction to boost their own policies. With a political alliance between Senator Fletcher and Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt would be able to promote his New Deal program and Fletcher with his job creation. Environmental damage was another major concern. Although fuel consumption by ships may decrease through a quicker route, local critics centered on irreversible damages development entailed, such as harming native wildlife. Although the construction plan included retention lakes, this system would represent less diversity than before. It was argued that due to decimation of much of the aesthetic beauty of nature in Florida, the tourism sector Florida relied heavily on would be harmed. Ladies and gentlemen, it pleases me to report to the people of Florida and the nation that the long-sought cross-Florida barge canal is now well underway. The project was started in 1935, before halting a year later for environmental reconsiderations, especially groundwater concerns. Drainage occurred, as many sinks had permeable bottoms into the porous limestone or aquifer. Then, it restarted in 1964, once again with protection and shipping cited as major reasons due to World War II. The debate intensified. Several predictions proved true. For example, in Ocala, although business increased between 25 and 50 percent, many native businesses were displaced. The small African-American predominant town of Santos was decimated as state officials purchased much of its land. As opposition to the canal festered, Marjorie Carr co-founded Florida Defenders of the Environment, or FDE for short, in 1969, an organization dedicated to seizing the construction of the Cross Florida Barge Canal. The FDE released one of the first ever environmental impact statements, written by a citizen group. Carr's statement was later supported by a suit filed as the FDE worked alongside the nonprofit advocacy group called the Environmental Defense Fund against the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regarding construction of the canal. This discourse heavily influenced the passage of the National Environmental Policy Act, signed in 1970, which requires federal agencies to incorporate environmental considerations in their planning and decision-making. This helped give them a leg up in the fight to preserve the river and the rest of Florida's ecology. Carr appealed to Nixon, U.S. President of the time, understanding that he could make a change to the construction with his power. She presented legal challenges to the development, to which he eventually agreed to halt the construction after a federal judge issued an injunction to stop it. He later released a public statement regarding the action. The Cross Florida Barge Canal was halted, a product of the culmination of a debate that had been occurring for three centuries. Nevertheless, already built parts had not been taken down. $50 million had already been spent on it over $350 million today. In 1990, the official deauthorization of the canal made the project lands renamed the Marjorie Harris Carr Florida Greenway. The Greenway is 110 miles long with the Conservation Center and recreational activities. Several other environmental victories were inspired by the halt of the canal's construction, such as the abandonment of a proposed airport near the Everglades National Park. Despite the successes resulting from the final collective decision to stop the construction, canal supporters were disappointed by the loss of money and possible benefits of the completed construction, such as military and economic development. Although debates over new public works still occur, the lessons learned from the discourse of the fate of the Cross Florida Barge Canal will hopefully help us approach such issues in a more nuanced manner. In the end, the story of the Cross Florida Barge Canal is one of Florida's most important stories. It goes beyond the Ocklawaha River and fighting for what you believe in, and brings to light the struggle Florida faces of preservation versus progress.